Hello, everyone. Today we have Dr. Tom Crenshaw in the podcast, and uh, just want to say, Dr. Crenshaw, welcome to the show. Great, great to be here today. Kind of an honor to be uh, allowed to talk with you and visit with you a little bit today, Marcio. Oh, the honor is mine. I've been a big fan of yours, and uh, you know, if I have a calcium phosphorus type of question, I know who to contact. So. It's always good to, to have that kind of relationship. And uh, for those that don't know you, uh, if you can just share your journey so far and also how you got involved in pig production and, and where you are today. Okay, good. Uh, usually when students ask me that, um, uh, that question of a little bit about my background and often they will pick up a Southern accent of well, say that I grew up in a cotton patch in Tennessee <laughs> uh, and on the family, small family farm that I grew up on, we did not raise pigs so I did not you know come from a farm a swine farm background but after finishing my undergrad work at University of Tennessee at Martin I ended up in a graduate program in Nebraska so moving to Nebraska that's had worked some with pigs uh, in in Tennessee and jobs in at the university but it was at Nebraska that I actually uh, started in a technician position at Nebraska after Tim Staley, who was uh, another graduate student, ended up at Kentucky, Tim did, and then at Iowa State. But I took over the technician position that he had and had the opportunity then going through graduate school as a technician to uh, get involved in quite a few different areas in the swine nutrition area. And I think that was the right fit for me now was to work with pigs. I probably... As an undergrad, I would say I had more experience with um, beef cattle, cow-calf operations growing up in the South than I did with pigs. But that's part of my background. And it was Nebraska then uh, that I gained more experience with pigs, then ended up in a faculty position at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, have been there uh, in this position now since 1980. So that dates me a bit. A whole life. That's amazing. Very cool. And um, yeah, so I guess we can, we can get the ball rolling. Um, a lot of talk around uh, lameness recently. Um, some folks having some lameness problem there in their production systems. What, when you look at lameness and nutrition, Dr. Cremshaw, what are a few things that come to your mind? How much could uh, nutrition be related? And if so, what are the areas that one should look at? Well, you know, certainly as, as a nutritionist, but I would like to be able to solve all the lameness problems with nutrition and change the diet and, and make it work. Uh, right. But uh, I would have to admit after a whole career that I've mentioned working in that area, and it's been an interest of mine uh, is since the graduate school days, I would have to admit that uh, we cannot solve all of the problems with nutrition. So uh, disease certainly plays a role with that. Nutrition, uh, you know, would have to acknowledge plays a big role with that. Um, but also things, simple things like the width of the slats and the roughness of the slats and what that might do to abrasions and opportunities for not necessarily pathogenic organisms, but uh, lesions that might occur to allow organisms to enter and cause inflammatory responses. All of those can, can lead to lameness uh, disorders in the pig. But it's certainly a problem that we would like to be able to resolve. And uh, as you mentioned now, I'm aware that recently there seems to have been a flare up of lameness related issues. Uh, had the opportunity to participate in some discussions with different industry groups about that. Uh, and I would acknowledge that uh, it's a very complicated issue uh, as a listen to what's been done to try to resolve uh, those issues. Uh, but oftentimes, m my comment now coming as a nutritionist is that we cannot solve the problem simply by adding more minerals, calcium and phosphorus to be more specifically into the diet. And sometimes I think we may create a problem by actually doing that, by over supplementing the diet. And it seems, you know, as I listen to industry groups, that may be more the problem from a nutritional standpoint of one of over supplementation rather than, uh, you know, what we might have historically described as a gross deficiency of calcium and phosphorus in the diet. We don't see much evidence for that in a lot of the pig production um, uh, enterprises today that there's a deficiency, uh, inadequate amounts of calcium or phosphorus being added into the diet. 
certainly the ratio would be important and my colleagues would would uh, you know acknowledge that right quick that we need to talk about the ratio of calcium and phosphorus mistakes can be made there uh, the area of phytase certainly complicates that and what, what happens with the calcium phosphorus ratio when phytase is being released, uh, used to release extra uh, phosphorus. Wow, yes, super interesting. And, uh, and uh, almost to back it up a little bit, the, you know, just going back to g g selection, uh, I'm thinking of sow farms right now, but the problem is on finishing pigs. But as I think of sow farms, I think of a huge selection, but also like heavy sows. But transitioning back to finishing pigs here, um, the i don't do we know if uh you mentioned uh, like the, the over supplementation which causes to increase the bone ash at least in some of the studies that i've seen right do we know if that excess could make the bone too firm or too strong and that could be a problem or we don't know quite yet or that would be a, a okay hypothesis at least I, I think i would list it still as hypothesis that the over supplementation of mineral could affect is especially the joints and the cartilage. Now, some of my colleagues would disagree with me on this, uh, especially some of the veterinary pathologists, and I've had you know good discussion and interaction uh, over the years with them. So that's why I would still list it as a hypothesis. But if we look at mechanical testing and you look at bone, that the trabecular bone just beneath the cartilage, if that bone becomes too stiff and too rigid, that may cause damage to the cartilage. So what we see that ends up as a final lesion uh, may appear to be a cartilage lesion, but that may have actually occurred because the bone did not yield enough and bend enough as loads were being applied that that allowed some damage to come uh, into the cartilage. So that hypothesis has been around for a while. It's very difficult to think to prove that. Uh, that the mechanical testing and stiffness of the subchondral bone may actually lead to some of the lesions that we see. And one of the reasons, you know, that that's such a difficult area is uh, with the techniques that we have to measure those lesions, uh, those techniques that are often applied uh, are used in the, to assess the bone after the animal has been euthanized and, and the bones have been uh, excised and looked at uh, in a, a, a necropsy setting. So some technologies now that we have quite an interest in uh, here that we're working on would be to develop methods that would allow us to assess the bone before the animal is euthanized. In other words, follow the progression of those throughout the lifetime of the animal. And we've done some preliminary work now in that area of what we might do to even that subchondral bone and regions of interest just beneath the cartilage. So it's an area of interest and in, I think a lot of reasons to to pursue that, but to say that, yes, this is how much calcium and phosphorus you need or how much bone ash you need, and you should not go beyond that point, that's a very difficult statement to make that I don't think can be fully supported at this time with the data that we have. Right, and, and I guess similar to some of these, the prolapses problems in sows is that sometimes it's almost like a, a little rare, event in a population of pigs that then temp sample size because i'm thinking hey can we run a a large scale study where you randomize and you, but you would have a you need several thousand pigs right in a large production system well controlled randomized study but on a large scale in order to see hey right because i, I know you're thinking more from the basic standpoint which which would be good but i'm also thinking from the applied if if there's any any way we can figure something out on, on that standpoint as well. Yeah, the, the whole uh, problem of uterine prolapse is, you know, certainly has gathered a lot of attention, but as you mentioned, now it, it is very difficult in kind of a, uh, a controlled study uh, to generate enough animals to accurately predict that did this particular dietary change uh, have an effect. So our, our approach has been kind of the opposite to take a smaller number of animals in carefully controlled conditions and try to set up conditions that we might uh, induce physiological changes that would, uh, would help us predict whether or not uh, something like hypocalcemia drop in uh, blood calcium levels 
would that perhaps be something that we could induce in the animal? And we've actually done that experiment uh, just recently reported uh, the results from that. And we tried to induce hypocalcemic responses. Now, certainly I should say this, uh, and most of, I think my colleagues would know this, but Wisconsin is known as, a, as the dairy state. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the students in the class and my colleagues in the department are in the dairy area. So I've always told the students in class and they get upset with me a little bit with this comment sometimes, but I say that I've learned more about the dairy cow since I've been in Wisconsin than I really care to know about. Okay, so, you know, that, the, the building might fall in on me here with, with that statement, but I have learned a lot now from my colleagues in the dairy industry, and it, especially about this whole area of hypocalcemia. That's a big problem in the, in the dairy industry. And it's, it's helped to formulate some of my thoughts. I should also mention that I, you know, growing up in a small family farm, I used to milk a cow by hand every day, but that doesn't take me very far with the dairy industry in, uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin either. But the, the hypocalcemic response now that occurs in dairy cows and um, some of the colleagues here that have worked in that area and listened to their graduate students in seminars, understanding how that occurs in the dairy cow, I would say that the pig uh, even though I've been asked that question many, many times, we have no evidence that the pig experiences this hypocalcemic response. Mm-hmm. So we have intensely measured uh, serum calcium concentrations right around farin, looking at you know a few days before, a few days after farin, measuring serum calcium uh, concentrations in animals that have been uh, either indwelling venous catheters and looking intensely at the calcium levels. Uh, We went one step further and it's counterintuitive, but uh, this is what we've learned in the dairy industry by feeding to the dairy cow excess calcium during the transition period. That actually leads to more hypocalcemic responses or milk fever responses in the dairy cow. And I think what we understand about that mechanism, it actually shuts down two major responses in the animal. The, if the animal is fed a low diet, they increase the um, active transport in the GI tract to absorb more calcium. But they also, um, with, a, with a high calcium diet, they would shut down the remodeling of bone, the reabsorption of bone. So in the dairy cow, Uh, The cow, when they suddenly have a calf and begin to produce a lot of milk, does not have the physiological mechanisms to mobilize the calcium. So two things happen uh, or have been applied in the dairy industry. They would feed a lower level of calcium during the transition period, which you say, well, if, if they're hypocalcemic, they're bound to need more. But see, that's not true. The way the body, understanding how the body works. And then they also, also uh, by increasing the bone uh, turnover. And the application now in the dairy industry is going to acidify the diet during the dry period using different um, anionic salts that might be used to cause the bone to be stimulated to turn over uh, and be geared up. So the mechanisms, the osteoclastic reabsorption of bone that would occur during that time period Uh, The cells are ready and they're activated. When there's a need for calcium, they can help release the calcium from the bone. Well, with that sow, the diets that we typically feed to the sow are to grow and finishing pigs for that matter are already acidified. So the argument is that we do not need to do more to acidify the, the sow's diet because they're already being fed diets that would allow that to occur. So. Uh, from, from those concepts, though, we learn something about what controls serum calcium levels, the acidification of the diet, certainly GI tract absorption, and then what we might do with, from a nutritional standpoint to make sure when the body needs more calcium, they're able to mobilize uh, the calcium from the bone to make it available to the animal. Wow. No, sorry, I'm, I'm going too fast. Maybe. No, I, I mean, you're definitely exploding my mind here a little bit. 
which I love. Uh, so a few things here. One is that the sow is super resilient, right? Which is amazing, right? The homeostasis really work on that transitioning sow. Is that a fair statement or not? No, I, I think it is. And, and, and part of it is, is the, are the ingredients that we feed to the animal. If we fed the sow more of a forage-based, grass-based diet, if we go back to acid-based balance, mm -hmm. something that's higher in potassium, uh, then they might not have the acid load and they might shut down this remodeling activity. But the fact that we're feeding corn and soybean meal to that sow during gestation for the most part, or distillers grains, those type of ingredients result in a net acid load and the way the body compensates, one of the major mechanisms that the body has to compensate is mobilization of basically phosphate or buffer from the bone. Uh, Super cool. So, so to make it clear, right, when you're talking acidification, you're just talking, hey, the dietary electrolyte balance of the diet is on an acid um, result or net result. Uh, we're not talking, hey, add acids to the diet, right? No, yeah. no. It's, it's, I think it, the diet is the ingredients, the electrolyte balance is always already in a way that uh, would favor kind of a, the need for the sow, for the pig to get rid of that net acid load. Humans kind of, for the, for the most part, fit that same category. So humans that would consume basically a typical Western diet, as it's labeled in human nutrition, versus if humans consume a strict vegetarian diet, humans that could consume a strict vegetarian diet would have more of an alkaline load. Mm -hmm. So in that case, they would be more similar to the dairy cow, mm -hmm. or humans that would consume the typical Western diet would be closer to the pig. And that changes how they respond in mobilization of bone reserves. Wow, super interesting. And as you look um, into the late gestating sow, when it comes to minerals, but, but even other uh, nutrients, I know I've been fascinated a lot last several years for the amino acid side. Well, we've well, at least my conclusion on the amino acid side is that that sow, the stating sow, really prioritize that those fetuses so much that if you give twice as much amino acids, it's not going to improve the birth weight. At least, you know, it's the balance of the literature in my reading. Do you see that? prioritization as well uh, when it comes to other nutrients or what's been your experience in that arena? Yeah, that's that's a tough one because it's it's easy to look at some of the studies now that have been done. And I would agree with your you know conclusion there that it's uh, the cell already does a lot to provide for the developing fetus. In other words, they will deplete their body stores in order pr to provide for the developing fetus. I think that's kind of a standard set point that we might start with with the cell. What happens to the sow in subsequent reproductive cycles now might be influenced, but the developing fetus of that litter now that's being the sow provided for would, would be provided, I think, by the dam depleting body tissue reserves. Right. So then the long-term compensation and the repletion of those comes into the second, third, fourth parity. And as you know, those studies are very difficult to do under controlled conditions as well. As you mentioned with the uterine prolapses, you know, those numbers, but to have enough animal numbers to follow animals multiple parodies. I mean, I'd say, yes, we need that type of information, but we also need that under very controlled conditions to answer some of the questions. So we can do experiments with, you know, growing pigs and answer some of the questions. And we have data that would say, now, I'm extrapolating back to the sow, so be careful with my comments here. But with, with uh, growing pigs, if we deplete the bone mineral reserves, they do not compensate and catch up for that to the same extent that we might if we deplete muscle reserves. So if we feed a diet that's deficient in amino acids, mm -hmm. and then given the adequate management and time course, the animals with classical studies, the animals can catch up with energy or amino acid right. uh, depletions and make up for that difference. We're not saying anything about the economics of that now. Right. But the evidence, limited evidence that we have with bone is it's more difficult for the animal to make up that difference in bone. So if they go through a period of depletion uh, in the skeletal reserves, and I'm talking about 
and we have studies now where we've depleted the mineral reserves by in young growing pigs by about 60 percent based on whole body DEXA scans of the pigs wow. and then that was over a four-week time period and then looked at recovery of animals from that depletion they increased mineral dep deposition when we released the depletion but they never caught up to the other animals in the time course of that experiment was, was did that not show compensatory growth responses in skeletal tissue very interesting did that one went all the way to market or not uh no actually we didn't we did not do that uh, all the way to market so you know the question would it make a difference in lameness of the animal at market weight i do not have an answer to that question so uh, some of my colleagues up in Canada have done experiments where they're looking at multiple depletion repletion cycles and taking pigs all the way to market. Um, and part of the idea is can we improve the efficiency of mineral deposition in the animal by short periods of deficiency and then replete the animal. Uh, but the how much bone ash and how much bone strength you need uh, to get that animal to market that's a difficult one to answer as well. Wow, super interesting. One comment on the on what you said, which is so true, that it's super hard to do you know, three, four cycles on a study. There's one study that I'm aware of um, from Dr. Andre Mauman there in Brazil, about a thousand females. Uh, he was looking on, a, should you give more feed in late gestation or not? Of right. course, when you talk feed, you're talking all nutrients at the same time. Um, but he went four cycles and... But the funny thing, he gave more feed or bump feeding in the first uh, cycle, but not in the others, uh, okay. just for logistic reasons. If he, if he had done in all, all of them, would be even more uh, accentuated or the magnitude would increase. But he did see that, yes, when you give more feed, it was actually worse for the retention rate of those females, which was super interesting. But you're so right. We need more of those and, 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 and come up to, to the right answer there on, on many of these areas. Well, and, and then, you know, as we just talked about now with you know, looking at, at, at amino acids and energy. Right. And if you get into the minerals and vitamins and right. the body may be able to compartmentalize those differently and right. regulate those differently. So uh, when you're changing all the feed, which I certainly appreciate the difficulty of doing those studies and, mm -hmm. and changing everything is, it's, you know, it's at least a start right. in, in the right direction. Right. But partitioning out individual nutrients, that's a completely different and huge challenge for us to accomplish that. Yeah, and what you said, I, I, I appreciate that. So I'm learning so much as always here. But I didn't know that, that what you just described in the last few minutes, that difference, difference on, on the repletion rate, amino acids versus phosphorus and calcium. So that's... And, and so, you know, even if you go back you know, to the cell... Uh, and what we do to the sow in one cycle or to the developing guilt and the carryover effects of that through multiple cycles, I would have to acknowledge that, we, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think we as an industry know the answer to, you know, kind of the longevity question. And that's always an easy question to ask, uh, but it's a very difficult one to generate the answers to that question. Right. And for me, it's always a fine line, right? We do need more research and boy, we need a lot of those long-term research. At the same time, of course, again, calcium phosphor, I think is a more delicate area than amino acids, like we, we, you just said. On the amino acid front, it's always that, uh, I think it's called the cautionary tale, like, right? Uh, ask the questions, throw out the problems, but never do anything, right? Uh, from a more practical <laughs> standpoint. But the um, from amino acid standpoint, I feel fairly confident in and comfortable, but I, yeah, cow, cow foss is a whole different ball game. Yeah. Appreciate that. When you look at cow foss um, today in the industry, in the US or around the globe, what do you think is the most um, or the biggest uh, mistake or misconception that you hear or and see uh, from a more industry standpoint? I, I think from my perspective, and this is a little bit of a bias now on my part, but it's and it maybe an extreme pushback, a little bit more of an extreme pushback on my part, because I think I see it as more of a mistake. And I would say that that mistake is that more is better. Why? Okay. I just, I think that's the mistake that is often made, that if we have a lameness problem, we have a bone problem, 
we have to add more calcium and phosphorus. That's the mistake. And what, what we're doing to the animal when that happens is often we shut down a lot of the physiological mechanisms that the animal has to kind of protect itself and to improve the efficiency of the use of that nutrient. And so we're increasing with the excess, we're increasing the animals, really what they're trying to do under those conditions is get rid of the excess. So they're excreting a lot. We lose efficiency when we do that. But we're also de uh, deprived of the animal of its ability to actually gear up some of these physiological mechanisms that we talked about that would allow us to uh, maybe make more efficient use, but the animal has then the flexibility to adapt and to adjust uh, with those nutrient inputs. I think that's, that's the biggest mistake that I see. I love uh, it. The, the other one now would be, um, I, th I think dealing with, you know, and, and this is a challenge now with all of my colleagues that are in the industry that work with fine taste. I'm going to say this, okay, I'm in the ivory tires of the university and not, not in industry and I respect and have a lot of friends certainly in, in industry, but uh, fine taste uh, certainly works. It's very efficient. It's a huge contribution to the, to the industry, not only swine industry, poultry industry, especially. And so I highly uh, value that. But the stability, the ability to predict the activity. And then as a nutritionist, we formulate diets and I tease the students in my classes, okay, how many decimal points do we carry these calculations out to? Right. And I always tell them, well, on your, on your calculator, okay, or computer, you know, we can easily go 12 decimal places. But how accurate are we with that? And if we take all the things that can happen with stability, shelf life, the unknowns that we have with nutrients, and then we're trying to tease these out to three or four decimal places or assume that we're calculating the diets that accurately. The numbers you know, certainly can be accurate, but the values that we're working with are often not what we think they are. And then that, what that leads to, I think, is kind of a, either a false sense of security or an overconfidence in our formulation, rather than again allowing the animal some, not not just a margin of safety. We try to mask that by over supplementation. I go back to that point, but the margin of safety of the animal's ability to adapt and to adjust to those. Uh, and that gets us into the calcium phosphorus ratio under conditions of phytation. And that's kind of maybe with all that I've said, what it really comes down to is we, we mess up that calcium to phosphorus ratio with the wrong assumptions or inaccurate information about what we think we're releasing in terms of phosphorus. Right, right. Uh, phosphorus and also the release of calcium too, right? From that phytase. What's our take on the, because I've been having that conversation last uh, year or so on the, um, a lot of times when it comes to release from some of these enzymes, but let's call it phytase. Um, you know, when it comes to amino acid and energy, I think it's quite a bit more questionable than versus uh, phosphorus, of course, which works great there, but also um, the calcium. So uh, my question is, do you, would you agree with a statement? Hey, I think it's actually more conservative to give at least some release to calcium on that, on that phytase, um, say if it's uh, equal, um, say, if you're releasing 0.1 on the phosphorus, you would release 0.1 on the calcium. That's, in my view, I might be wrong, correct me. That's more conservative than if you give zero calcium release. Uh, what's your take there? What's being our okay. experience in the arena? So I think a lot of it depends now on what you do with that is also what you're setting as the calcium to phosphorus ratio. And if you're reducing calcium by giving credit to the phytase release, then I think you're moving in, in the right direction. But if you already have the calcium over supplemented, mm -hmm. okay, in other words, you're on the upper end of that 
effective range of calcium to phosphorus and there's all kinds of different ways to express that okay right um but so i'm just going to talk about calcium to phosphorus ratios and not try to define the different yeah, terms that are used okay um but by over supplementing calcium what you have found through research trials within our research unit and other industry groups that often uh, we have more calcium already in the diet right. than what we're assuming with uh, what's going into the formulation uh, ingredients. So there's calcium coming in Slide that beam, could yeah. amount to about the same level as what you're giving credit to on the phosphor or on calcium release from phytase. Mm -hmm. okay. It depends mm -hmm. on how accurately you know compare compare the results of your formulation to dietary analysis if you have confidence in the dietary analysis. Right. So start with the ingredients first. Before I even talk about phytase, let's just make sure, hey, uh, do you know how much calcium is in the, the soybean meal? Because they put limestone there as a flow agent in your premix, in your antibiotics, if you're using any, and th those sorts of things, right? Right. Yeah, and, and so that's that's difficult. And if we are involved with a research trial, we'll analyze the ingredients now before mixing the diets because of the variability of calcium, especially if it's an experiment involved with calcium. We want to have analysis on those ingredients. And I'm going to say this analysis in our lab that we have confidence in recovery uh, from and, and more so than, okay, let's just submit a sample to a commercial lab and Sorry, you know, my friends in the commercial labs, I'm not trying to, to slam those labs, but uh, sometimes you get some very, um, I've described it as unreliable result coming back. And calcium can be all over the place. Calcium is not that easy to analyze. It's no. really easier than some other nutrients, but uh, it's, it's not an easy analysis to do. Right. What's, let's talk about that for, for a second. What, what's been your experience on how to go around that? Uh, do you need more samples? Do you, what do you do, right? Um, well, yeah, one, I would say calcium, especially in, uh, you know, using uh, wet chemistry analysis would probably be important. Uh, our preference would be to, to do nitric perchloric digest sulfuric acid digest will sometimes affect the results of calcium um, analysis. So doing a wet chemistry rather than NIR or some analysis along those lines. Those I don't think are very reliable at all for calcium. Let's see if we get now where, where you were wanting to go with me on, on the question here is-, is okay. No, that, that, that's helpful. I guess I was going, why do you see a little more reliability? So you mentioned a few of these components of the actual analysis. Um, I remember, I think it was Dr. Josh Flor and some of his studies, you know, he, what he did was just getting quite a bit more samples. You know, you, you basically, I think everyone should know that calcium analysis stuff. So make sure you are prepared for that. You have a little more samples or that kind of stuff, right? right? So a larger sample size is certainly be good, but how you collect the samples and, you know, if it's a pelleted diet, you're not quite as, as worried about what would separate out or mm -hmm. sort out and then subsampling that even that larger sample becomes a critical feature of how do you subsample that because you send the lab, you know, a subsample, maybe of that larger sample. And sometimes the labs are giving you back the results of what you've sent them. And so the sampling may be the, the, as much of an issue as what the labs. So if you, you know, want to test your subsampling routine, send, you know, multiple samples of the same ingredient that you've subsampled, riffled those, carefully divided those samples, and then send that to multiple labs what's the coefficient of variation within the same sample that you've collected? Establish a procedure there in maybe a lab that you're working with where you have confidence with that. We kind of forget sometimes those basic statistical terms, okay, of how much variation is in that sample. And then if you think about that variation, if you have a CV of 30%, coefficient of variation of 30%, you know, you might as well use the book value and forget paying the lab to do the analysis. Okay. <laughs> right, right. The other one that's interesting on this arena is some feed meals might call, uh, doesn't matter if it's monocalcium, phosphate, or dicalcium, they just call dicol. Right. Sometimes. So make sure you're asking those labels and know exactly what's happening. Uh, re read, read the label, certainly, would be the comment, is make sure you know what's going into the diet. And yes, that terminology, uh, especially monocalcium, 
monocalcium, dicalcium phosphate, dicalcium phosphate, you know, and an interesting little comment is some of the trace minerals in those ingredients also vary quite a bit. Uh, the manganese and um, iron content will vary depending on the source of um, monocal versus dical that you're using. That's a whole different uh, comment, but I think it can also have implications on lameness problems in pigs. Super interesting. And then you get to the calcium side of things, right? Uh, calcium carbonate. We we're talking what I forgot top of my mind, but thirty eight percent versus thirty six. You have you have that that sort of a difference there, right? Right. There, so there's a range certainly in in what you would have in in book values or the source. You know the limestone. Uh, you know the different purities of that would affect the outcomes of different uh, amounts of calcium that would be present. And that can have a difference in the loading values or the final values in your diet calculation. If in your formulation spreadsheets, you have you know, one value, but you're actually using a different product that somebody in the purchasing side of the feed mill got a, a good bargain on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they need to transfer, make sure they're transferring that bargain information forward. And you can formulate diets now with the different values, but uh, you need to know that. Right. So since we're talking about uh, some of these analysis, uh, when you think about, vi we talked a lot about um, CalFOS, right? But uh, how about uh, vitamins or even minerals, but vitamins specifically? Uh, you see a lot of people trying to analyze that directly in the feed versus the premix or even checking the batch sheets. What's your, what, what's your recommendation? Yeah, I, I think for most, well, some of the vitamins you could pro possibly do on a feed level basis. Uh, vitamin E might be one example of that, but most of the vitamins you're probably uh, better with an analysis of the premix that went in the vitamin premix that went into the feed, taking a sample of a complete diet, submitting that to a lab, go back to what you were mentioning, Dr. Floor, you know, large sample sizes and then riffling that down. Uh, but the lab would need a fairly large sample size to accurately do something like vitamin D and the feed. I think most labs, most people would say you're probably wasting your time to try to analyze the feed, a complete diet for vitamin D. No. It just, it's, I mean, you, you can come back with the results, but the reliability of that and the variability in that analysis is quite large. You're better off with, with a concentrated vitamin trace mineral package to do vitamin analysis on that. Right. So you're talking about vitamin D, right? You've done a lot of work on the kyphosis model. If you can share a little bit uh, for those that are not familiar with that and what you found there, Dr. Crenshaw. Yeah. Well, that, that just, you know, briefly, and we've talked about this a lot of different times, and I'm sure some of my colleagues have, are, are tired of hearing about our story, but <laughs> maybe for those that have not heard about it, it uh, actually before a national feed recall, uh, we had kind of a year head start because we had an accidental deletion of vitamin D in a premix. And we went back and actually were able after the fact to confirm that. But it took, you know, when we saw in our research herd, a 25 to 30 percent incidence of kyphosis in our research herd that occurred over a four month time period, it appeared and disappeared on its own without us really changing anything. Mm -hmm. A year and five experiments before we could kind of with confidence say, this is what caused it. And the, the deficiency came about uh, by the accidental deletion of vitamin D in the premix that was being fed to the sows during gestation and lactation. So we on a routine basis in our research herd in our feed mill turn over our concentrated vitamin premixes on about a four month time period. So it was that turnover and that management that it appeared disappeared really before we knew uh, the full answer to the story. And so with quite a bit of effort, we went back and kind of proved that we could leave the vitamin D out of the gestation diet and create this humpback condition in the pig. So there's, you know, certainly stories, but most of my colleagues in the commercial industry would wonder, well, okay, you solve that problem, just make sure you've got plenty of vitamin D in the diet. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, Laura Amison, that's worked with me a lot on that problem uh, over the years, 
Uh, we've we've learned a lot about bone and bone turnover because of that accident and also the importance of the maternal diet. So those are things that, you know, an accident occurred and we struggled through to, to try to prove it looked a lot like we had a problem with mold and microtoxins. If you mm -hmm. looked at the symptoms of the pigs, mm -hmm. the pigs showed a lot of symptoms, but our commercial lab we could not detect any uh, mold or microtoxin problems in our corn uh, or the diets. But yet swollen vulvas and large mammary glands oh, it was bound to be a microtoxin problem. So we did an experiment mm -hmm. in which we had no corn in the diet, even though the analysis was negative, formulated some diets, fed these pigs, and they showed very similar symptoms and with the swollen vulva and large mammary. So there's something going on uh, in that, and I still do not understand those symptoms in relation to vitamin D deficiency. Okay, could, could any, any of that come, be coming from a soybean meal situation or not, like the estrogen? Well, type of yeah, we, we've wondered about that. I think we've kind of disproven that once we got down to the vitamin D, okay. and that was kind of also a little bit of an accident working with uh, one of my uh, campus colleagues that was over in the UW hospital looking at analysis and trying to develop some analytical techniques. And he's the one that actually kind of got us on the vitamin D because he said our pigs had no detectable vitamin D. Wow, incredible. And he was doing quad mass spec analysis. And, you know, we were able then to, with multiple experiments, you know, so you can ask what kind of a cutoff point values of vitamin D do you need? Right. We had, pigs going through our research unit all the way to market with no detectable vitamin D in the serum. Okay, and those are, are where 30% of them had the kyphosis, is that right? Well, that's out of that, yeah, in that same time frame now that we've done that, so we've... Okay, because the question I have is, all right, uh, do we need that, what, what was the cutoff? Do you need to be at NRC or 2X NRC or what's that number where you stop it? Because like you said, most people hear something and that's back to your biggest mistake in nutrition that you see, which is more is better. Well, just because you hear that not having it's terrible, right? you don't need a lot. Right. Uh, yeah. And so we still on a routine basis in our research herd, our, our diets now are at about 300 international units for the sow. Uh, international units of vitamin D3 per kilogram of diet. Okay. And we've done that for years, years now and we do not have the problems. And I know industry is much higher than that. Right. Um, and all kinds of complications now that I can respect that, that are out there. I would not, I'm not necessarily recommended or pushing that, but you'd say, well, compared to NRC, now with 2012 NRC, we would be below Really the amazing. recommendation of 800, but dig back through the literature and see where that the foundation for that recommendation. It's pretty limited amount of data to go into that. Super interesting, and that's a, a whole right. Uh, there's, I remember a paper from Dr. Don Mahan from 2002 at the Midwest Conference, and he talks about high vitamin A uh, reduced E in the serum, and also high vitamin D reduced. Uh, E in the serum as well. That was Dr. Floor more recently. So back to what he said, a lot of a lot of something could be even be har harmful on other aspects. Well, and the other thing, while I'm maybe have the, the platform here with the audience now that, that you provide you know, a lot of exposure to uh, you know nutritionists in the commercial industry, is oftentimes we read, I think, a paper or hear paper at a conference and one level goes up. So we add that additional nutrient to the diet. Do we ever look back and think about what happens with the interaction with other nutrients? Okay, so a single addition, and then we come along, maybe go to another conference, we come back from that conference, we add something else, but we never necessarily ask them, what's the balance of all of those nutrients in the diet? So it goes back to more is always better. We're always looking, trying to, improve certainly that's i think is the motive we want to improve the conditions for the animal but we do that by adding more and then we add more on top of that we add more on top of that and we never step back and think well what's the potential interactions that might be occurring you mentioned the vitamin a and d you know there's certainly a physiological basis for an interaction between those two nutrients vitamin e and vitamin a and the roles they play in even an antioxidant 
certainly opportunities for interaction between those nutrients. So we get to kind of artificially all of a sudden jacking up one nutrient. And then does that force us then eventually to elevate the, the other nutrient to keep up with that one? Maybe if we drop some of those nutrients back down to a more reasonable level, we might have the balance and not the excess that is there. Wow. It, that's a challenge now to do that. Yes. And, and that's right along the same area that I'm passionate about, which is the whole cell feeding, uh, uh, body condition score instead of giving too much feed. And it is the same principle. Um, since we're talking about this, uh, you know, vitamin E and maybe selenium, right? Right. I went back to, to see what is the actual data behind that versus uh, mulberry heart disease. And it's not extremely strong, the, the amount of, you know, the, the, the causation there. But what's what's been your any insights on that arena? In vitamin E, selenium or? And, uh, right. And also like uh, their deficiency in causing mulberry heart uh, disease. Right. Any insights there or not? It's not being an error that you've. Well, I, I've not done as much, you know, certainly research in that area. I do teach a comparative nutrition class. And so in that class, I try to get students down to understand the principles of how these nutrients are working. And certainly the role as free oxygen scavengers, you know, oxidative damage that would occur and membrane damage that would occur and knowing that the different compartmentalization in the cell that vitamin E and selenium work in with vitamin E being more uh, within the membrane and then selenium through glutathione peroxidase and um, those enzymes being involved more in the cytosol, they, they certainly complement each other. Mm -hmm. they, they're not necessarily uh, interacting. And what we do with the diets and the oxidative load that we put on the animal, the generation of, of uh, free radicals, that's going to occur as part of metabolism. Right. And so the body is geared up to protect uh, against those and, and scavenge those free radicals, then the damage is not done. But if it's not there, then we propagate those free radicals and we end up with a lot of membrane damage and you get leaky membranes and that, you know, begin to explain some of the lesions that you see uh, dead tissue with the mulberry heart disease. And that's really down to the, to the membrane damage that's occurred uh, that those nutrients are protecting, designed to protect against. Right. Super. My, my point is that I, I, I can understand that, that, the basic there but when you go to find actual empirical data hey you know low vitamin e and selenium high whatever reasonable number of pigs let's see if we can actually cause it's a tough one right would you agree with that yes yeah yeah and one of my father was a you know he's retired now a number of years but uh in the school of veterinary, veterinary medicine here on campus I uh, also had evidence that a uh, pathogen, and I don't know if I remember with confidence, but he would get involved with a lot of cases where mulberry heart disease had been diagnosed, and he would always want to look for a specific pathogen that might be involved with that as well. So pathogenic causes, inflammatory, I would go back now to his comments and say possibly mediated through some type of inflammatory response that's consuming more of those nutrients by the need for, for oxidated uh, scavengers, uh, that those organisms can also play a role. So the health status of the animal, I think is a critical thing to impact some of the nutrients. And let me go back now before I get you know calls from some of my colleagues out in the industry is, yeah, certainly I realized that, that a lot of times in our university set in our research herd, we have a herd with a very high health status and we can get away with things here right. that might not occur out in the real world. And that's, I certainly respect, you know, that challenge that's there. Uh, but it does bring about a complication to this issue of understanding what not only the pathogens, but also the non-pathogenic bacterial load that might be in the environment and how that alters the immune system that would begin to impact the demands of uh, or needs of the nutrients for the body. And mm -hmm. those are certainly all issues that need to be con considered in how you 
how you design a diet, formulate a diet, what target level do you uh, to try to provide in the diet for the animals under the, that particular condition or that particular environment. Right. And I, and I appreciate you making that comment, right? You know, uh, in industry uh, and you have feed mills and you have uh, warehouses and it's hot and whatever else. So I, I think we all understand that. And I appreciate you, you commenting that. But, but also, I just want to say that we appreciate your, uh, your original thinking, because one thing is just to grab a book and, hey, let's just feed these university cells, whatever it's in the book. Well, we in nutrition as any other area of science we need to understand the the extremes mm -hmm. so you are there on the low extreme pretty doing pretty good right yeah. uh and then now and then sometimes we, have, we are at five times that number or even 10 times or eight times in some of these vitamins when you get to one order of magnitude you you need to start asking uh questions and trying to understand right right and 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 a lot of times it's not just the economics of those, but my, my maybe comment, uh, I think, and where you're going with that uh, statement, my comment would be that sometimes we try to throw a Band-Aid or a patch at the something and assume that we're solving a problem by throwing more nutrients in there. And yeah, we I, I certainly respect my colleagues out in the industry that, you know, they've got a problem, they need to fix it, and it needs to be fixed now. I mean, the pressure is there. The reality is there. Right. But I'm not always sure that that's the right fix. We feel better that we've added something into the diet that should fix the problem. Mm -hmm. But we would not continue to have problems if that had fixed the problem, okay? And so then that's when we need to step back and maybe take some of the nutrients back out of those formulations and look at what is it that would really require that problem or help that problem to be resolved. Uh, identify that problem. I mean, I made the comment with the vitamin D deficiency. It took us a year and five experiments, yeah. you know, to solve, you know, that problem. But I think we went about those experiments very intentional and very methodical rather than, okay, we, we took a rifle approach. Okay, here's zero in on one specific question and try to answer that rather than the shotgun approach is we're going to we're going to throw everything into the diet do a complete rebound and hope that it just goes away right no i so, love it yeah if we if i can make one other statement oh, back to the vitamin d and the kyphosis is from our perspective we i think we've learned more about the bone and how the bone is developed and because of that mistake and it looks like the the lesion that's actually there is probably more of an osteochondrosis lesion. We think about vitamin D and bone mineral. Well, we have evidence now that we're not dealing with a mineralization problem in this particular situation. It's more of the signals that are involved turning over and replacing that cartilage. And so we've learned a lot about the cartilage and bone mineral interface and the turnover of that. And hopefully that helps lead to ways that we can resolve some of the osteochondrosis problems that are out there and they're creating i think a lot of the lameness issues how they're creating that and what nutrient we could put back into the diet to solve the problem or what vaccine we could give to the animal to take away a pathogen problem i don't think we have the answer to that one yet but i think a methodical approach is important here rather than a shotgun approach Right. Something that just came to mind a few weeks ago, I was, I was talking with Dr. Mike Tokash on the topic, and uh, he actually sent me some papers from, I think it might be 10 years ago, uh, that they've done uh, there on use, uh, increasing methionine and threonine that did help reduce uh, osteochondrosis, and, and, I, and I was not aware of that. So, so again, the increasing from where to air, right? It's the, right? So we would have to go back to the paper and see what was the ratios, you know, are we going from a regular industry level to a higher or below industry to a industry, whatever, right? So just uh, go there and take a look. Uh, I, I would encourage everyone. But I guess uh, one comment you mentioned uh, you, on, I guess, an analogy that I want to make there on the um, vitamin E, I was mentioned vitamin A, uh, high vitamin A, five times NRC, which is current industry level, that reduces vitamin E. So if we have a mobile heart disease case in the field, hey, let's just add more vitamin E. Well, 
consider reducing your vitamin A a little bit. So I guess it's along with what you're or reducing. reducing the vitamin A. Is that what, yeah. Yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Re consider reducing your vitamin A a little bit so you can maybe uh, keep a good level of vitamin E in the zero would be a Dr. Mahan's study back. Right. And, and vitamin A, as you know, it would be very relatively inexpensive. Vitamin E is certainly more of an expensive nutrient to add. Right. And so that might help with the final line. And that's where, you know, kind of adding one nutrient on top of the other and rather than stepping back and trying to reduce that or look at the total package and say, what can I take down? Right. And, and since you are brainstorming on this arena, I'm thinking because uh, uh, mulberry heart disease and the whole thing around free radicals, uh, it increased with the high growth, right? Well, I, I think that would be, you know, so if, if you have adequate growth, you're increasing metabolism and oxidative metabolism generates these free radicals. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the normal process. It's not that they're necessarily bad. So you take a, a healthy, rapidly growing animal, right. they're generating, if I can use the, the, the analytical term, a boatload uh -huh. of uh, oxidative you know, radicals that there, but the body, if they can compensate for that, there's not a problem. It's when we tip that a little bit with some, maybe an inflammatory response or a nutrient deficiency that we end up with this membrane damage that could occur. Very interesting. I wonder as a hypothesis to throw out there for, for everyone is if we, if, if you're having that case in the field and you reduce your tryptophan and valine ratio just a little bit, so you reduce growth, okay. would that help? I mean, I'm just brainstorming here. Uh, uh, it, it might help you find another job because <laughs> nobody wants to slow down the growth rate of the pig. Okay. Right. We accept of COVID times, right? Which right. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. it's a good segue for the research you're doing there, Dr. Well, but, but mortality now, you know, you know, by a slight increase in mortality, you can certainly cover the cost of a lot of, you know, additional nutrients that might be added. And so we don't want to see an increase in mortality, but slightly reducing the growth. Right. And that would be an important uh, feature to do. Interesting. Let's let's talk about the research you've been doing there, Dr. Crenshaw, on reducing the growth uh, with ammonium chloride, uh, you know, due to the problem the industry had uh, recently. What, what did you find? Well, uh, this goes back now and, and certainly a problem that uh, the industry is well aware of last spring. And we hope that we never go back through that uh, that cycle again where the you know um, packing plants have shut down because of covid uh and we have no place to ship the pigs uh so um and, and my colleagues now at iowa state i certainly want to acknowledge and give credit uh, they were on top of this and they had information coming out almost uh, they must have anticipated okay they <laughs> john patience uh lauren Gunner, they they had information coming out almost a, I would say within a few weeks after the plants closed down. So I want to compliment them for the job that they did uh, in that regard. Right. Uh, but I'm listening and seeing some of that teaching class from my basement, okay, trying to put lectures together and feeling pretty helpless in swine production class that I was teaching, hearing this until I got a call from one of my colleagues in the feed industry and he's asking questions about what we could do with the diet and calcium phosphorus ratios came into it. Uh, and so it suddenly dawned on me that, you know, the, the calcium chloride uh, that they've used in, in one of the diets, the group from Iowa State uh, have used that, has been around. And that certainly is a way of acidifying the diet, but it does complicate what happens with calcium and phosphorus ratios. Mm -hmm. And so as I was being posed with this question, it suddenly dawned on me, why not use ammonium chloride? Now, and it goes back to some of the discussions that i would had with renal physiologists here uh, and even back what I mentioned earlier in this conversation about the dairy cow. One of the early acidifiers for the diet for the dairy cow to reduce the incidence of milk fever was actually ammonium chloride. Mm -hmm. And that was used, but one of the problems with it, it reduced feed intake. And again, with the dairy cow, kind of like we do with pigs, nobody wants to slow down milk production or slow down growth rate of our pigs. And so uh, that product was often masked or encapsulated things to prevent it from reducing feed intake. But what we're trying to do when the slaughter plants are closed down and we want to stop the growth rate of the pig, that's exactly what we need to happen is we need food intake to drop when you have animals that are group housed 
and you don't want aggressive behavior to occur, they have feed in front of them. If they can, you know, have the feed and then they're not as aggressive, but then as electrolytes, if you can turn it around and not necessarily compromise the bone with what you might do with the calcium and phosphorus, uh, that looked like, wow, that would be a much simpler approach. Awesome. So going back into the literature into the 1940s and 50s, I mean, ammonium chloride has been used in studies, a lot of studies, renal physiology to understand kidney function in rats and humans. You can find plenty of papers in the 1930s and 40s where humans are being supplemented with ammonium chloride trying to understand renal function. So if we understand what's occurring with the kidney, ammonium chloride is much simpler than calcium chloride. And then it's less likely to complicate some of the other issues. It's just that nobody's ever really fed that much to pigs because nobody wants to slow down the growth rate of the pig. And then all of a sudden we want to slow down the growth rate of the pig. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Now we had at our university research facility, we had the same problem that the industry did. We had no place to ship our pigs. And, you know, we tried to manage, uh, we were fortunate having an empty barn on the experiment station that we could move some pigs into. But uh, our crew, and I give them credit, because uh, we're working under quarantine isolation and all of those uh, conditions. So we cut into our water line and added ammonium chloride into the water. Mm. It's water soluble, uh, very easily going into solution. So that would give you a very rapid way to respond to a sudden stop shipment order. Mm -hmm. Certainly with the plants closing down with COVID, uh, we could also face a similar challenge with a foreign animal disease break. Again, something we don't want to happen, but if we needed suddenly to stop the growth rate of the pig, if you've got bulk bins that are full of feed and you need to stop rapidly with a Sawzall, you could cut into a water line put a pump on that. We've got a system now worked out. We can show and be glad to share that, uh, how we managed, or I should say, uh, Jamie and our, our research uh, crew managed to cut into the water line, set a tank up, and we were feeding ammonium chloride within a day through yeah. the drinking water. Yeah. Any any recommendations on dosage, but also, uh, as I understand, you, you've done also a, a regular uh, study as well on that on that? Yeah, we have now some ongoing studies. And after the ammonium chloride into the drinking water, we did try that. The first week, we had a 90% reduction in growth. Oh, wow. We should give one caution there. We did at the end, towards the end of that week, we began to see a problem in a couple of pigs. The pigs looked healthy. They looked normal. There was no aggressive behavior. I mean, that's... I probably shouldn't admit this, you know, this is being recorded, right? But uh, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't get back to our deans. But I snuck into the unit about five o'clock early one morning just to look at the pigs. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned, are they just not drinking water? Mm -hmm. But they looked good. Now with that, we did run into a problem with a couple of pigs developing ulcers. Mm -hmm. And that was alarm. We actually terminated that first study because of that. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to create a problem in the animal. Uh, we know now that that problem was probably not directly related. It may have been aggravated by the fact that they had ammonium chloride in the water. Mm -hmm. So it's a caution that's there. But we went from that then to can we add it into the feed? Mm -hmm. So we added ammonium chloride into the feed. And I know that there's not AFCO guidelines now for feed additives. If you're selling feed commercially, uh, there could be a problem problem with adding ammonium chloride, but there's really been no research done with ammonium chloride into pig feed for this particular application. So as a research university, we could do that. We added the ammonium chloride and, oh, I, okay, I got my number wrong. The first week with water, it was 80% reduction in the growth rate. And then we terminated that experiment. The first week with, I think it was 2% addition of ammonium chloride into the feed we reduced growth rate by 90%. Wow. Wow. Now, again, the pigs look, if, if you looked at the pig, you would not know that they were not growing. They were active, they were moving, they're not lethargic. So the pigs look good. We had no problem now in that study that went, um, I'm trying to remember, it went eight weeks. We got the pigs out to market, wait on that one. Um, started, started the pigs out early stop the growth. 
uh, no signs. We took four weeks that we had different levels of ammonium chloride in the feed. We got a dose response. We're trying to finalize that the amount, the concentration of ammonium chloride in the feed. But uh, the second week, the pigs began to compensate to that ammonium chloride and showed an increasing growth. Over a four week time period, we averaged a 50% reduction in growth rate of the pigs. Okay. And then what's important here, and we took, you know, actually we did that experiment after we had submitted a proposal to uh, USDA to NEFA. Um, we have funded now that we're continuing to do research in this area, but we, um, we did a kind of a preliminary experiment while the proposals out there with adding this into the feed. And we looked at the recovery point. Part of the proposal required the economic implications of this. So we're concerned about how fast do, do the animals recover after they've been held for maybe a four week or six week time period. Mm -hmm. So if you hold the pig, then the recovery becomes important. And that's where this electrolyte balance, I think is critical to allow that to occur. If we're doing that by changing electrolyte balance, the pigs don't grow, and then we can rapidly release the animals from that lack of growth by changing the diet back to a normal diet. The animals take off and grow uh, much more rapidly. We hope we'll show compensatory rather than just catch up growth without, now we do not have data on this yet, but without changing carcass merit of the animal. Mm -hmm. They should rapidly recover from that depletion. So that's part of what we're looking at in, in trying to continue to study uh, during that time period, optimizing the dose, know what level to feed. And I'm fascinated now with the fact that the animals have compensated. You say, well, it's no good. They, you know, 90% the first week and then only a 70% reduction and then a 60% at average 50% over a four week time period. Oh, well, that's no good. Let's give up on it. Well, I've had a conversation now with some renal physiologists and they recognize and acknowledge that that may occur with humans. Hmm. But what we're kind of fascinated with is kind of like the kyphosis thing. Can we learn something from this? Right. I think we can learn something about the renal compensation and how that's occurring and particularly what role bone buffer may play within this. And I think part of the compensation may be because of what's happening to the skeleton. And we can measure that with whole body DEXA scans of the animal, look at body composition and skeletal bone mineral content. So can we work on how that animal adapts in, in using phosphate that would be depleted from skeletal tissue to meet that buffer reserve and maybe still avoid in this case, avoid the skeleton from being turned over, like we mentioned with the dairy cow and the milk fever. Can we avoid that in how we manage the ammonium chloride in the diet for the animal? Wow. We still hope to, to solve that problem and have, if you could, a, a methodology, you know, the end point of this, a methodology, if we ever need to hold pigs again, and I hope we never need to do that, okay, for foreign animal disease or for COVID or other issues. Yes. But if we need to do that, uh, can we develop a strategy that would allow us to do that effectively with minimum economic cost to the producer? That's right. what we're trying to do with the project. Very cool project. Do you, uh, a little bit of a sidebar here is, uh, do you, you mentioned behavior a little bit, um, any insights on, let's say, if a producer is is having um, tail bite issue? Do you think? And again, it's one of those that's tough to run studies. But the question is, using a low, way lower dosage of ammonium chloride to in a one diet, for example, to uh, to reduce any tail bite problems. Hopefully, if, if it's a consistent problem, let's say every batch we have uh, problems in yeah. early finishing or whatever. Any insights there? I mean, it's a tough study to conduct because it's a rare event, as we know, multifactorial, but right. any insights there? Oh, yeah, that, that one, I don't know what I would predict on that. Probably, you know, holding the pig, a, a lot of the aggressive behavior that you see, uh, my opinion now would be contributed by, you know, multiple factors involved with that, even to the point of weather changes. I know Bob Fritch and some of the, maybe the listening in would recognize that name, you know, kind of an animal science ag engineer uh, from Nebraska. 
worked a lot of that in Mike Brum, that was his predecessor, followed to a lot of environmental weather fronts coming through tend to affect that. That's even in a confinement building right. and those low pressure uh, results coming through. I don't know how to control that. Okay. Super that, multifactorial, right? Right. Yes. Very good. I appreciate your insights there. Anything else here on CalFOS nutrition before we move to the three questions, Dr. Crenshaw, that I uh, oh. ask every guest? Okay, I'm, we'll wait for those three questions. But uh, no, I'm, I would just say that, uh, you know, I've been very pleased with some of these efforts and want to acknowledge certainly some of the grad students that have worked with me on these projects, uh, particularly Laura Amoson, uh, Mariola that you've met before and now has continued to work. She's worked on some of the hypocalcemic responses. Our spine research crew, their top-notch crew now really have been uh, very pleased to have them involved with the project. And we have now, as we've started some of this up, I have you know, three new graduate students we brought in to take on various aspects that we've talked about here today. So it's kind of fun and I enjoy certainly working with the students. Uh, that's been a big plus for my career. Super cool. Uh, certainly everyone appreciate the, their, their hard work there. Yeah. Very cool, Dr. Crenshaw. So the first question is, uh, what's your favorite uh, swine-related book? I, I would have to say this this textbook on uh, swine nutrition. Now, and part of that, uh, the North Central Regional Committee, uh, the reason I would say that's my, my favorite, not just because maybe I've written a couple of chapters in, in some of those, but it's actually to acknowledge how that book came about. And it came about through this North Central Regional Committee on Swine Nutrition, where we coordinate activity. But Elwin Miller at Michigan State, who's no longer living, but Elwin Miller had the, he was the brainchild behind that idea, the first edition that came out of that. And then that committee worked together to generate that book. Then Austin Lewis and um, um, Lee Southern took over the second edition and revised that. So, you know, if I look back at kind of a favorite book, it's not that I spend a lot of times laying awake at night reading it, okay? <laughs> but uh, it's it's the history behind that book that uh, I'd say that's a good uh, it's a good reference book to look at. Super cool, and that's um, is the blue cover, right? I think yes, that's yeah, condition. Yeah. Cool. Right. And then, how about a book outside of agriculture? Any other area? Any anything there that you like or oh. resource? Probably the, the the only other book that I spend you know any significant time looking at or reading at all is the Bible. Nice. And that's a, a resource for me and a comfort for me. And so when I need and get too stressed out a little bit, that's the book I would turn to to bring peace and hope for the future. And certainly over the last uh, say six to eight months as we've gone through this pandemic, that's been a a wealth of comfort and a reassurance for me and i'd encourage you if you've not spent time reading the bible spend some time in that you can find some very strange things in there okay I would <laughs> that. but you can also find things that would bring a lot of comfort and a lot of peace amazing uh, thank you for that and then lastly dr crenshaw is um what do you think sets apart successful swine professionals from those that are not in your opinion yeah, I think the thing that sets successful people apart, whether it's in the swine profession or other professions, would actually be integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, being, being true, being honest with what you're doing. So um, being able to speak the truth, uh, to say what's right, to stand up for what's right, you know, to look for justice, regardless of whether it's kind of in the work environment are just people that we meet walking up and down the street. So being honest with people. I have to say a little bit of a comment, if I can, on that word integrity. Uh, that word is thrown into the title of my PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the reason it's in there, I have to give credit to Austin Lewis, who was on my committee now at Nebraska. And uh, his definition of the word integrity is that this is why you should use that. I worked with bone break and strength and bone strength. That was part of my, uh, my PhD thesis. But he said integrity means soundness. Mm -hmm. It means honesty. That's the way I would have interpreted, but it also means soundness. So a person with integrity being sound, being honest, being true with what they do, I think that's what sets people apart. 
I love it. Dr. Crenshaw, this is a lot of uh, insights here over the last, uh, over an hour here, a really enjoyable uh, chat with you, learning from you, and I'm sure the audience uh, appreciate it as well. So thanks for all the work you do. All right, good. Thank, thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed being a part of this and uh, keep up the good work and new ways of getting information out. That's changing a lot uh, over my career or has changed a lot in how we distribute information. Uh, certainly a very effective uh, approach that you have going here. Absolutely. I appreciate that. And I, I, I tell you that there's more coming. I was just found there's a new crazy app that people jump in and out. Like it's almost like an open podcast live. Uh, it's crazy. It's yeah, it's crazy. There's a lot of stuff coming up uh, down the line. Super cool. So thank right. you so much. All right. Good. Thank you. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.